and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining. And today is our fourth uh, session in the discussion series on masculinities and gender justice, the need for systems change. And we are going to be focusing today on uh, social context. And we have talked about economic context, political context previously. And uh, we said in the first session, the stage for systems transformation, uh, which is really what we would like to mobilize collectively men engage alliance behind. And so today we will be focusing on social contexts and including looking at trends in increasing anti-feminism and the normalization of, uh, of violence, of patriarchal violence and uh, the role of politicized religion and also the trends that we're seeing there. And we would love to hear who is joining us today. Uh, so please share uh, your name and where you're from or where you're based at the moment in the chat box. And if you want, you can share your gender pronouns as well. And we just want to call to your attention that the session is being recorded. And uh, we are going to post the session also online on our YouTube channel um, after uh, in a couple of days after the session. And the previous three sessions are already online, if you haven't seen them yet. And uh, many, many other uh, sessions of the Men Engage Ubuntu Symposium that today's conversation is part of uh, are also online. So you can find them on our YouTube channel. And we are also live streaming this session on our Facebook page. So in case you know some of you might uh, be over there. Welcome as well. And um, I would like to share just a couple of household um, uh, technical uh, points to support you in participation. So on the next slide, you will see that we are doing um, live um, uh, interpretation um, also in subtitles. So um, if you go kind of hover over uh, the left top of your screen, you will see a red button that says live on custom live streaming. You can click there and uh, you will be able to choose your language. Um, and it will open on a separate screen in a browser. And uh, you will see the text interpretations there of what the speakers are saying. And if you minimize that browser, you can actually hover it over the Zoom call. Uh, and that way you will be able to um, to both follow and kind of see the, the people on the screen as well as see the texts of the interpretation. And we also have um, direct interpretation today in uh, Spanish, uh, English and French. So take a moment to choose your language. If you go down to the bottom, uh, there's a little interpretation globe symbol. You can choose your channel there. And we know already that people today will be speaking in English and Spanish. So um, also, if you um, are uh, listening in today in English, please choose the English channel right from the start. So as soon as somebody switches to Spanish, you'll be able to hear that as well. And we are, of course, like I said, this is part of the Ubuntu Symposium conversations. You can follow those on social media as well. There's discussion happening there with the hashtag Ubuntu Symposium and Symposio Ubuntu in Spanish. And then going forward on the next slide. Let's see where we are. I want to set the stage briefly for the conversation that we're having today. Because this is part of a, a, dis, a series of discussions that we launched um, to kind of dig deeper and unpack what is in this uh, discussion paper written by Alan Craig uh, with um, a lot of inputs from Men Engage Alliance members as well as some of our critical uh, external uh, partners. Um, and in this discussion paper, we seek to yeah, launch some critical reflections on the current state of the world um, in terms of political contexts, uh, social context, economic context, 
to really um, mobilize the Men Engage Alliance uh, membership and the broader collective behind this urgent need for deeper systems transformation. And the paper outlines also what um, norms and ideas around patriarchal masculinities have to do with some of those big challenges that we are facing in the world today. Um, and it's, it shares some ideas for what Men Engage Alliance and those working on transforming patriarchal masculinities and engaging men and boys um, could do to uh, be part of the movements that are addressing those challenges. Seeking uh, through these discussions to mobilize ourselves to be part of the broader movements for social justice. And we are really looking forward to hear from the different speakers today um, who will share uh, their experiences from their own context um, and then hopefully inspire us um, to also get practical. And what can we really do uh, in practice to, uh, to be part of those uh, broader movements that I was referring to. And Alan will be uh, in the first part of today's conversation uh, presenting um, what are the contents of chapter four, uh, which is about social context. And so he'll share a little bit more about the paper at that point as well. So over to the next slide, Bianca. And this is, like I said, these are all the conversations that we've already had. Um, today is about social context, anti-feminism, normalized violence and politicized religion. And going forward, we'll have two more sessions on digital context and the last one on operational context. So before we get into um, the conversation with Alan and our other speakers, and I'll present them shortly as well, we wanted to share a brief a video by uh, Professor Raven Connell. And, and she has developed um, a video address for Men Engage Alliance. It's about 15 minutes in total. Um, and we really welcome you to, to uh, watch it when you have a chance, if you haven't had a chance yet. Um, but we wanted to highlight this particular part of what she shares about her current uh, assessment of the state of the field um, and the context that we live in um, that really is very particular to today's conversation. And of course, Professor Connell has made very significant contributions to the field of critical masculinity studies. Um, so we were very thankful that she um, develop this video address to us. So let's have a have a listen and a look to what she has to say. And we've learned also that there can be resistance to progress in gender relations. There can be resistance even to the prevention of violence. And these are things that we have to think about very deeply. In fact, there has been opposition to this work from the start 40 odd years ago. My research was under criticism, under political criticism from very early. This is sometimes a matter of what, what has been called backlash uh, against feminist work of any kind. Um, sometimes it's a more uh, passive, generalised defence of men's privileges, a feeling that men are entitled to be boss in the home or in the workplace and that it's somehow against the order of nature if women should gain equal power. So there are different forms of, of, of resistance. It's something we, we do have to expect. One thing that concerns me, I think, is that the resistance has, in the last 20, 10, 15, 20 years, uh, gained some new dynamism and, and new ideas. Uh, so it has in some ways become more dangerous, I think. We've seen in many parts of the world the rise of a, a kind of authoritarian populism, um, in politics, uh, leading to national leaders who are, you know, misogynist um, or simply uh, heavily patriarchal. Uh, we've seen politics itself uh, 
restored into a kind of, of power cult uh, in, in quite a toxic way. And at the same time, and sometimes connected with this, we've seen kind of culture wars arising, sometimes from religious groups, um, sometimes secular, uh, which are hostile to the, the concept of gender or gender relations. We've seen mobilizations in, in countries as far apart as France and Brazil, um, right-wing political mobilizations against feminism, uh, against gay rights, against activism by men for more gender equality. So we're in um, a moment of history which is not easy to navigate. Um, and, and when we, we, we have legitimate worries about the kind of world that this resistance, these um, anti-progressive movements will create, So these are some of the trends that, that Raymond, Raymond Connell has uh, a sketch for us, which I think really uh, resonate also with uh, with what is sketched in the paper, that there's a rise in um, in backlash uh, against um, accomplishments and achievements in in gender equality, um, and that this is a real shift actually that has taken place over the last twenty years or so. Um, and as she says, in a way, it feels like our work and um, um, anybody working on, 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 on social justice, on, on gender justice, um, it, is, it has become more dangerous. Um, and that is definitely a very challenging uh, development. And still so many of you and so many of us are continuing this work in very challenging contexts. And, um, and some of those contexts we'll be talking a little bit more about. Um, so without further ado, I'd love to introduce our speakers for today. We uh, have Dr. Maria Rashid with us. She's been working in the human rights and development sector for over 22 years and has been associated with various non-governmental groups in Pakistan, including heading a national women's and child rights organization for 14 years. And she acquired her doctorate in politics and international studies from the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London in 2018. She wrote a book called Dying to Serve Militarism, Effect and the Politics of Sacrifice in the Pakistan Army by Stanford University Press, uh, published in 2020. And she continues to be involved in trainings and research on violence against women, gender, masculinities and militarism, both nationally in Pakistan and in South Asia. Welcome, Maria. We have Dr. Mary Ellsberg. She is the founding director of the Global Women's Institute at the George Washington University, which is a, a university-wide institute dedicated to producing policy-oriented research to promote gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls. And she has more than 30 years of experience in international research and program work on gender and public health issues. And she is very deeply connected to global gender issues, also from uh, the time that she was living in Nicaragua for nearly 20 years, leading public health and women's rights advocacy. And she was a member of the core team of the w uh, World Health Organization's multi-country study on domestic violence and women's health. And she has written over 50 books and articles on gender-based violence and ethical and methodological aspects of violence research. And Dr. Ellsberg has earned a doctorate in epidemiology and public health from Umea University in Sweden and a bachelor's degree in Latin America studies from Yale University. Welcome, Mary. Thank you for joining us as well. And we will have uh, Urbenia Guagare. Um, we hope she will be able to rejoin us. She's having internet challenges at the moment. Um, she's Men Engage Africa Youth Chairperson, um, a Southern Africa Yali alumni under the Civic Leadership Track Cohort 16. She has an associate degree in journalism and in media and a bachelor's degrees with honors in broadcasting and journalism from Likwonging University of Creative Technology in Botswana. And she recently completed 
completed her advanced certificate in HIV counseling and testing. Um, and she is a self-driven uh, and loves working with people. She's a human rights activist working for Rainbow Identity Association, uh, which is an NGO that advocates for the human rights of transgender and intersex people. Uh, she works as an advocacy and media officer, and amongst others, she did work with men and boys in Namibia uh, and trained on gender-based violence and intimate partner violence uh, prevention. Um, we hope, like I said, that Urbania will be able to join us again soon. Luego tenemos a Douglas Mendoza Urutia, es directora asociada para la Fundación Puntos de Encuentro y cofundador de la Alianza Men Engage. Durante casi 10 años fue co-coordinador de la red Men Engage para América Latina. También es co-coordinador de la campaña Menke en la región y fue coordinador de la investigación Encuentra Internacional de Hombres e Igualdad de Género, de Image Study, uh, with Promundo, en Nicaragua y El Salvador. Douglas tiene una amplia experiencia en el asesoramiento de redes de masculinidades facilitando grupos de hombres para transformar masculinidades, activista por los movimientos de justicia social e igualdad en Nicaragua y en la, la latinoamericana en general, participando en iniciativas de defensa dirigidas a poner fin a la violencia contra niñas, niños y mujeres. Gracias por estar con nosotros, Douglas. And we are also really thankful that Alan Craig has joined us again today. He's a gender specialist with more than 20 years of experience working on issues of masculinity, violence and oppression. He has published widely on these issues, including curriculum toolkits for professional development. He's an experienced gender trainer and facilitator of strategic planning and project design processes. And as a co-founder of the New York based Challenging Male Supremacy Project, he's committed to a vision of social justice with gender equality at its heart. And today is here with us as the lead author of the discussion paper, Context and Challenges for Gender Informative Work with Men and Boys. And I will be facilitating the discussion. Um, my name is Yoni van der Zand and I work as co-director of the Men Engage Alliance Global Secretariat. Once again, welcome to everybody. Um, we also invite people in the chat box to um, think through while you're listening to Alan, who's going to be presenting now, as well as any of the other speakers, how do these issues play out in your own context? Like really, please share those with everybody here participating and how do they influence your work uh, that you're doing? We would love to hear from you. If you have any questions for the speakers, please also share them. We'll try to carve out some, uh, some space to uh, feed those back in the conversation with them. And that brings me to Alan. Alan, you uh, you have the floor. Thanks, Yoni. Um, and thanks everyone for joining. Great to see so many of you with us again. We've had fantastic um, attendance at previous sessions in terms of the numbers of people and the interactive discussion that we've had. So I'm um, looking forward to this today as well. Um, next slide, please. So as Yoni said, um, Oh, and the next one, please. As Yoni said, the what we're discussing is um, this discussion paper that I helped draft as part of uh, Men Engage Alliance's strategic planning process last year. So this paper is based on the context analysis that I developed for that strategic planning process. And the analysis is based on a literature review, interviews with key informants that I did, and collective discussions of the Men Engage Alliance Global Secretariat and board, which included regional representatives. So it's there's some, you know, a lot of collective thinking has gone into the contents of this paper. And it should be stressed from the outset that. We wrote it, we wrote the context analysis, and then we've produced this discussion paper in order to stimulate thinking and discussion towards action. So it's important to say that it's not intended to be um, uh, an academic survey of everything we know about all these contexts, because that would take several volumes. Um, it's um, it's even 
though even given this it's a long paper for a discussion paper but it's supposed to be picking out or trying to identify highlights key issues that are are or should be of concern to everyone involved with the men engage alliance in terms of what they need to be thinking about in uh, thinking strategically about their work so it's a guide to it's it's intended to inform action next slide please uh, and as Yoni said, it's part of a series that we're doing on the discussion paper. Um, and we uh, will be talking about the social context today that are discussed in the paper. We previously looked at the political and economic contexts. And in the next few weeks, we'll look at the digital context and operational contexts. And again, I think it's important to say that while we've separated out these issues into these different chapter headings, um, they are interwoven with each other with each other so today we'll be talking about social contexts but making reference to political and economic factors and conditions and looking ahead to some of the digital considerations that we need to be paying attention to and what all that means in terms of our operations and strategies next content uh, next slide please so the three starting points for the analysis presented in the paper are that we need radical systems change. Uh, it's become clear, uh, if it was ever unclear, that um, the task before us requires significant change in political, economic and social structures and relations of power. And to bring that about, we need to really name and understand the forces and obstacles blocking progress towards that. So the purpose, part of the purpose of what we're about today in this whole discussion series is to talk about how we name and understand those forces and factors that we're confronting. And then the question that we are then in is how does our work and our broadly defined in terms of everyone kind of concerned with the work of that's undertaken by the Men Engage Alliance and its members, how does our work relate to and contribute to movements and agendas for that radical systems change that feminist activists and LGBTQIA plus activists have been calling for for many, many years? Next slide, please. So this is a quote that is quoted in the paper. We seek a radical transformation of a world in crisis, putting women, people and the planet over profit. And I think in kind of behind or underpinning a lot of the analysis uh, presented in the paper is a sense of uh, interlocking crises of politics, economics, ecology, um, and now epidemiology, epidemiology as we've uh, learned to live with over the last year, certainly uh, on a global scale, um, needing to see how those uh, crises interrelate and how they interrelate with gender injustices um, to create oppression in people's lives. So needing to understand this big picture of radical transformation. Next slide, please. And the paper also uh, refers to work done by the Women's Rights Caucus, which kind of uh, convenes civil society organizations at, at the UN and the women's rights caucus highlights the need to recognize the neoliberal economic order as a key structural barrier and we talked a lot about that in the economic context discussion but seeing that in relation to the rise of authoritarianism that raywan connell was just talking about fascism nationalism xenophobia supremacist ideologies and fundamentalism and the need, the importance of rejecting the actions of regressive groups who reinforce patriarchy, nationalism, fundamentalism, authoritarianism, and capitalism. And obviously that's a long list of isms, but it's kind of thinking about the how they relate to each other and reinforce each other that that, that is our task, uh, I think. Next slide, please. So this chapter in the paper looks a bit more closely at three social contexts, which uh, the paper argues it's important to take greater account of the first being kind of trends in social attitudes on women's and LGBTQIA plus rights, uh, the extent of normalized gender based violence and, and what uh, we need to think about in order to challenge that. 
and politicized religion, which again, uh, Ray was referring to in its relationship to patriarchal backlash. Next slide, please. So the paper looks at uh, briefly at different data by which we might assess trends in these social attitudes and looks at data uh, concerned with the growing support for far right parties and formations in different parts of the world. And there's data there that's kind of tried to understand this growth of support for the far right, which again, Raywin uh, alluded to. Um, explanations for that often kind of pick out two uh, contrasting explanations. Is it to do with the 2008 economic crisis and economic conditions that are fueling kind of uh, greater mass support for the far right? Or is it to, more to do with a social rising, social conservatism and cultural backlash? And I think if you look at the data, just look at the data in terms of support for Trump's uh, first electoral success and his narrow electoral defeat last year, it's clear that we need a more complex analysis than just economic um, dislocation as the fuel for that far right support. And in fact, one of the largest studies of both European and US voting patterns ended up arguing that we need to focus on this sense of cultural backlash amongst older, more socially conservative populations to changes, progressive changes in attitudes and policy on gender and sexuality issues. Now, I think this kind of contrast between economic and cultural explanations is a little overdrawn because economic uh, problems can be culturally inflected and expressed. But still, uh, this sense of a, uh, a backlash from socially conservative forces is something we need to be taking greater account of. The gender aspects of that are also unpicked by some of this research. Uh, certainly some of the early research tended to highlight um, men's greater support for far-right parties in different parts of the world. So there was a kind of gender dimension to that cultural backlash. I think in more recent years, there's been a more complicated view of that gender, uh, those gender dimensions of support, growing numbers of women are themselves involved in far-right formations. We know about 53% of white women voting for Trump in 2016. Uh, the paper talks about the presence of women at all levels of uh, far-right Hindu, Hindutva movements in India. Um, so we need a complex picture of that kind of how gender relates to far-right support. But if you look at data from the International Men and Gender Equality Survey, the images data, there is some sense that perhaps men's attitudes are changing um in different parts of the world and obviously the paper um there's a danger of massive overgeneralization. the paper is uh painting a very broad brush picture but i think if you look at that images data certainly the reports of the images data uh, surveys over the years there has tended to be a story of progressive change in men's attitudes um, so the younger generations of men tend to show more progressive gender attitudes than older generations of men. And that was the story that was emerging from different country sites in the images survey. And more in more recent years, um, that story has been called into question. So if you looked at the data from the Middle East and North Africa survey a couple of years ago, younger men surveyed uh, had less equitable gender attitudes than older generation. So there is some sense that perhaps the trends are changing uh, and we need to think about why that might be. One force to consider in those changes is a growing a more vocal and visible uh, movement of men's rights activists. And the paper discusses uh, some of the signs of that, quotes from research in India uh, during looking at the progressive you know looking at the increasing influence of men's rights activists clearly if we think ahead to uh, the next discussion on digital contexts 
the rise of um, the manosphere online has played a significant role, I think, in uh, increasing the visibility and vocalness of that men's rights activism. And I think we need to understand or look more closely at the politics and emotions of male victimhood that have been mobilized by men's rights activists. So in many ways, they have flipped the kind of uh, progressive script on oppression and targeting by systems of oppression. And, uh, you know, the claim that they make is that they are the true victims of oppression by feminism. Um, and there's a strong kind of emotional appeal to that male victimhood that we need to reckon with, I think, in countering uh, their propaganda. Next slide, please. So this is a quote from the research in India that I briefly referred to from uh, Srimati Basu. Um, she looks at this transnational, transnational men's rights movement whose commonalities can be found, as I said, in allegations that women's violence matches men's, in the denial, minimization and excusing of violence, in assertions that men face difficulties reporting domestic violence, custodial decisions are biased against fathers, and that the state garners political popularity by supporting feminist arguments. And I think in different countries, you can see different expressions of those men's rights activist claims uh finding increasing prominence and it's something that our work needs to take greater account of i think next slide please and as uh, this is a quote from gabrielle hossein uh based in trinidad and tobago she, we sent her an earlier version of this paper and she wrote back with some great comments and feedback and, and one of the comments spoke very clearly to this concern about the rise of men's rights activism. Um, and she said very simply, I, I, I do not see male allies taking the risks we do in relation to men's rights groups. And that for me, knowing that those men are not out there, regardless of how much we train or fund or facilitate or give ideas to or guide or whatever is huge. That's what I want, male allies that will hold the men's rights movement accountable so that women don't have to. So it's laid out very clearly the challenge for all of us involved in this work that um, this is a, the threat coming from men's rights activists as women and LGBTQI plus communities have been dealing with for years, the threat's increasing. And, you know, we're being asked the question, where are we in relation to taking action on that? Next slide, please. Next slide, please, Bianca. No, stay on normal. No, stay on normalized. On yeah. Just go back one. Thank you. So uh, just go forward one onto the normalized patriarchal violence. Okay, we got there. Um, so this is the second context, and it's a context that um, the men's rights activists have made much of. Right, that men are men are the true victims of violence. Uh, and the violence of feminism, if, if you like, rather than the other way around. But what's striking, and the, the paper discusses this, is the extent to which patriarchal violence against women and girls and LGBTQIA plus communities, simply the extent of its pervasiveness and the normalization of it. Now, most of us on this call probably know the figures that WHO and other bodies put out in terms of um, the levels of uh, the rates of violence. So we know the figures, um, but still sitting with the kind of emotional uh, reality of those figures, I think is important for us to keep doing. Um, we last year with the COVID related lockdowns, we heard these very quickly, these reports of surges in domestic violence, and it was a to me, it was a kind of reminder of this underlying uh, reality of violence that we, you know, the field, the, the men for gender equality field has been working on for many years, right? Um, and still we are dealing with this situation where within days of people being locked in their homes, we saw a surge in cases of 
violence against women in the home. So we need to reckon with that. Um, and I think the first thing to do is to reckon with the politics of this violence. I think over, there is a concern over the years that some, some of the ways in which the men for gender equality field is related to the violence has become less political rather than more political. Uh, I think we need to think about the links between different sites, agents and targets of violence and not uh, be, be wary of the boxes into the different categories into which the violence is put as if those are discrete categories. Uh, from the 70s onwards, with all the push against uh, making domestic violence subject to uh, legal intervention and uh, public concern, domestic violence is understood as the violence, the domestic expression of systemic patriarchal violence. So, and I think there is a way, there are ways in which that kind of analysis has uh, been diminished or reduced, I think. Um, we need to recover that analysis of a sy sy systemic violence based on patriarchal relations of power that finds different expressions and different targets and different agents in different in a range of sites and making the links across those sites. So the paper looks at uh, some research which has looked at the if you look at the backgrounds of some of the men who commit mass killings in the name of political terrorism, they themselves have histories of domestic violence uh, against their female partners. So those links can be very direct across those different forms of violence. We also need to reckon with the politics of impunity. We know, again, research shows that many, perhaps most perpetrators of patriarchal violence, and then it's mostly men, uh, do not face any sanction for doing that. For perpetrating the violence. Um, as Raywin suggested in, in her video, uh, in recent years, we've seen a rise to leadership of openly misogynistic leaders who've openly, at, as in their own lives, have um, embodied that impunity with regard to the violence they themselves have committed. And I think the field needs to, to you know, to take greater account of the misogyny that fuels that impunity, uh, the societal misogyny that uh, feeds and fuels that impunity. Uh, it's a word that I don't see as used as much as I would expect it to be used in much of the writing produced by the men and men for gender equality field. So we need to um, be kind of talking more about where does that misogyny come from? What sustains it? What fuels it? And what can be done to challenge it? And that all feeds into a reckoning with this systemic patriarchal violence, which we need to uh, be responding to and how that links to other forms of oppression. Next slide, please. And this is a great um, definition of patriarchal violence, which draws out those systemic uh, dimensions of it. So it's put out by the Abolishing Patriarchal Violence Innovation Lab, um, blackfeministfuture.org. Um, and it, uh, they describe patriarchal, patriarchal violence as an internet interconnected system of institutions, practices, policies, beliefs, and behaviors. So you have that kind of range of agents of violence there that harm, undervalue, and terrorize girls, women, femme, intersex, gender non-conforming, LGBTQ, and other gender oppressed people in our communities. So it's violence that's working across those different aspects of the gender binary. Patriarchal, patriarchal violence is widespread, normalized, epidemic based on the domination, control, and colonizing of bodies, genders, and sexualities. And I think in that formulation, you can also see some of the roots of such violence in colonial histories uh, and imperial histories as well. It's a global power structure and manifests on systemic, institutional, interpersonal and internalized level. Um, so when we think about the work we need to do, we need to be thinking about work across those levels and the interlocking systems of oppression. Next slide, please. So that suggests then that we also need to think more clearly and look more closely at the state itself. Uh, the state, um, depending on who you talk to, is a source of justice or it's a source of violence. Right? Uh, and 
you know, in effect, it's both for different constituencies and communities. It will be differently experienced, but we need uh, the field, I think, needs a more complex view of how we relate to the state in terms of the ways in which it can be a source of justice and challenging the ways in which it is a source of violence in, in different in the lives of different communities. I also think this emphasis on the systemic nature of the violence across institutional and ideological levels challenges us, challenges us to think a bit more uh, in more complicated ways about social norms. Because this social norms paradigm, as I read it and understand it, has been taken up very broadly um, in recent years in relation to work on gender-based violence, and not least in terms of work with men on harmful norms of masculinity as the way to address that violence. So that social norms framework, I would say, is very widespread. But I think we need to kind of unpack some of the intellectual and political roots of that concept itself, because I think it has varied uh, roots. Um, and we need to kind of understand the different implications of this, those different roots. Certainly one of the roots of social norms comes from a very kind of individualized model of game theory. So if you look at some of the early writing on social norms done by uh, Biccieri, um, which was taken up by UNICEF and others, that came from a kind of uh, individual decision-making model, uh, how individuals make decisions in relation to reference group expectations. So that's a, that's a game theoretical approach to understanding social norms, which says nothing about power, right? It's got nothing to do with power relations. It's to do with individual calculations of social reference group expectations, but a very different uh, understanding of norms and discussion of norms comes from more sociological traditions. So you could look at Bourdieu, Bourdieu, the French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu's notion of habitus, which is the kind of inculcation of habits of thought and practice that serve to maintain hierarchical relations, or even Gramsci's notion of hegemony, which is the production of a common sense that legitimates hierarchical social relations. Now, Bourdieu and Gramsci weren't sp focusing specifically on gender, but I think you could use them as resources for understanding the ways in which hierarchical gender relations are produced uh, by powerful institutions. So I think what that directs attention to is that our social norms change work cannot just be concerned with changing individual uh, responses to their reference group that we need to be thinking about ways of changing uh, and challenging the institutions that normalize patriarchal violence. And understanding that patriarchal violence as related to the gender binary, which is not just about male-female relations, but also to do with LGBT and non-LGBT relations, and to do with uh, transgender and cisgender hierarchies. So the gender binary kind of organizes gender relations in those binary and hierarchical ways and the violence maintains that. So challenging the violence is also challenging that gender binary. And then I think thinking about what all that means in terms of men's range of experiences of that violence as agents and also as targets in different settings. And I know there's a challenging discussion that's ongoing about the extent to which we should talk about or highlight men's own experiences as targets of different kinds of violence. I uh, Personally, I think it's an important conversation to have because it understands differently gendered bodies and people in relation to this systemic patriarchal violence. But that would be interesting to hear from the discussants, their views on that. Next slide, please. So this is a quote from uh, Rachel Dukes, Darren Stern and Leanne Ramsumar, uh, which is drawn from the What Works program. And, and they're acknowledging that the recognition that norms-based strategies may not be sufficient to reduce violence because social norms are just a part of the portfolio of drivers of violence in, many, in any setting. So we need to be thinking more broadly about the changes that are required to bring about that change in patriarchal violence. Next slide, please. 
And finally, the final context, as Yoni mentioned at the beginning, was this uh, the ways in which religion has become politicized and implicated in what uh, was being described as the patriarchal backlash. So the paper looks at uh, the data suggesting uh, trends in religiosity, the importance of religion in people's lives and what that might mean in terms of gender uh, relations and politics. I think we need to avoid a simplistic account of you know, growing fundamentalism equals increasing patriarchy. Certainly some of the initial discourse, you know, consequent upon the the US declaration of the war on terror was a a kind of Islamic, Islamophobic discourse about Islamic fundamentalism, which often used gender as a framing for that fundamentalism. So uh, it was even claimed the US was invading Afghanistan in the name of women's rights. So we need to be careful about this kind of association of um, patriarchy with particular forms of religion. Um, And we know that men engaged members across the world are working with different faith-based groups to promote gender equality. Um, But we also need to reckon with the importance of religion as a social movement and different religious groups and organizations as social movements in themselves and the ground that has created for political mobilization. So we talked about uh, last time the retreat from social provisioning. Uh, under neoliberal policy regimes in many countries. And you could look at a number of countries and see that that void left by the state has been filled by religious groups providing social and welfare services and increasingly being the locus of kind of political protest. So Mike Davis in his Planet of the Slums, which looks at the growth of uh, informal urban settlements, the massive growth of informal urban settlements across the world, often finds there that the political mobilization to protest social and economic conditions in those urban informal settlements is led by religious groups. And I think this social movement basis has created the basis by which religion can be taken up by um, forces of social conservatism and political authoritarianism to kind of fuse the two together. So Ray, uh, Ray and Connor was talking about, the, you know, this uh, patriarchal backlash, which is focused on uh, gender ideology. Now, that's that's a long standing target of certain religious groups like the Vatican from even before the Beijing conference in 95. The Vatican was putting out uh, propaganda about gender ideology uh, as being a threat to uh, society and it's often framed in terms of a threat to the the family as the basis of society so this is the final thing to say i think in terms of the context with, within which we're operating there's a a fuse a use of religious ideology by religious groups and other political actors to kind of bring together this social conservatism and political authoritarianism which is based on a patriarchal notion of we need to protect the family and the national family. So, you know, Raywin talked about the increase in intensity of that uh, religiously fueled authoritarianism over recent years. And I think you can see links between that and a rise in ethno-nationalism in recent years as well. So a concern with borders of the nation, and the kind of borders of the family which need to be protected from external threats. So what does all that mean for us? Next slide, please. Oh, so this is just a reminder about, this is a quote from um, Beinart in The Atlantic, making clear that these, uh, the, the war on women being waged by these authoritarian ethno-nationalists and populists it's about gender and sexuality, so it's uh, attempting to roll back progress made on same-sex marriage, uh, gender wage parity, access to contraception and abortion services, etc., the rights of LGBTQI persons. But importantly, it's also affecting um, more you know, uh, systemically related issues uh, linked to racial justice, ensuring the rights of refugees and migrants, and promoting inclusive societies. This, this intense... 
attention to the border of the nation and the family uh, is racialized in many contexts as well. So next final slide. So what, what does this mean? So the paper doesn't say a lot about this, and this is why we've brought the discussions together to talk about some of these implications. But in brief, I think the paper looks at the need for less field and more movement. And by that, it, we mean that I think uh, over the years, I think the, the field of gender equality work with men has invested a lot, and I've been a part of this, so this is a self-criticism, as the field has invested a lot in kind of developing itself uh, as a as a site uh, of expertise on uh, an in inverted commas engaging men and boys with the danger that it's become treated as this kind of separate separate and separable area of work with its own body of knowledge and expertise um there are criticisms by many that this has led to a kind of parallel system of gender work, which is increasingly disconnected from ongoing feminist work with women and girls and work by LGBTQIA plus movements. So we need to come back to a sense of we're a part of a movement and figuring out the contributions we can make to movements to end systemic patriarchal violence. And I think one of those contributions that we can make is to really focus on this impunity that I talked about and challenging the normalization of patriarchal violence and thinking about that impunity as expressed individually, uh, the individual level, but also institutionally and ideologically. Uh, heeding Gabriel Hussein's call, we need to be doing more to show, to show our solidarity in practical terms. So the, the, there's an increasing talk about accountability and solidarity across the Men Engage Alliance. We have the Accountability Toolkit, and a lot of conversations have been done on accountability. But I think there is a clear call that we need to listen to, that we need to be doing more, stepping up, and particularly confronting men's rights activists, um, wherever they show up, whether it's online or in the street. And to do that, I think we need to be challenging the ways in which those men's rights movements appeal to men and we need to be making our own appeal to men um we're in a raymond talked about culture wars and i think there is a way in which we need to recognize that we are in a culture war in many places and to win the war we need to be having a more sophisticated approach to the way in which we're enlisting and reaching out to support uh, to get the support of men and i think in the course of the strategic planning process last year and the evaluation that was done to support that, there was a sense from a number of Men Engage members that were still struggling to, to reach out to many men uh, to get them to hear the messages that we're trying to convey. So there's a, there's a kind of um, it's a strategic question there, but also simply a kind of practical issue about how do we make our work and messaging uh, more emotionally resonant and appealing so we're bringing more men into um, our work and to do that i think we need to be thinking differently about the theories that we draw on right there's a lot of attention that we give to kind of behavior change communications and this kind of social psychological account of social norms theory i think we also can broaden that to include more um uh, understandings drawn from social movement theory in terms of how messaging uh, gets framed, how agendas get framed, uh, and how agendas to move people to take action uh, for institutional change, for example, get mobilized. So different social movements have long histories of thinking about and theorizing their work uh, in terms of how to bring about social change. And I think we need men engage needs and its membership needs to kind of pay more attention to that learning from social movements and their their theorizing of their work so that we can be more involved in the social change efforts that are needed to end the patriarchal violence and i'll i'll leave it there thanks everyone thank you alan a lot of food for thought and a lot of food for discussion i think um i just want to feed back a couple of comments from people in the chat box you've really been reflecting on what they've heard so far 
Uh, Akshat Singhal from India said, I think this backlash that we're seeing is actually um, a response to society's boundaries being pushed. And so there's kind of that back and forth between progress and then backlash. Um, Sarah Wyszyski um, from the UK said um, there's like a lot of um, ignorance still or even um, uh, in transparency in sharing the widespread uh, gender based violence actually and the statistics around that. So if the World Economic Forum, for example, um, would pay more attention to gender based violence, it would be a whole different story. But it seems that politicians are uh, particularly not interested in uh, in really seeing the full picture. And there was also a comment there that under COVID, gender based violence has really increased. Um, and then we had uh, Savita Kukarni from India as well saying, the more I interact with women and men from different categories, like uh, in age, class, caste, education, power, etc., I see that men and women from privileged groups are more patriarchal. The backlash to feminism is coming from this uh, sector, in my experience, uh, and it is the middle and higher middle class around me which are becoming champions of uh, Hindutva, so Hindu uh, nationalism conveniently forgetting that it's basically a fundamental uh, way of living. Does it mean that our ed education system has failed to sensitize them or does it mean that it is not an easy task to increase the power structure chain? So thank you for sharing those reflections and, and questions here. Um, so we're going to hear now, um, finally, I would say from, uh, from our speakers uh, and, uh, and our reflectants today, Unfortunately, Urbenia is indeed not able to join us anymore uh, because her internet connection has failed. These things happen online. Um, so we are having a little bit of a different setup. We'll hear from uh, Maria and Mary and Douglas um, together right from the start, uh, bringing the three of you together. And the first um, set of questions that we wanted to start off with you um, is basically a little bit broadly around um, the problems that Alan has sketched in the paper, um, do you recognize them in your own context? What resonates? Um, but also, what do you see um, is perhaps missing uh, from the analysis so far that we also need to be taking into account as we go forward and get practical in our work? And how relevant and useful did you find the, yeah, the, 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 the contents of the paper so far? And if I may just dig a little bit more specific actually into chapter four, um, of course that chapter describes a trend in social norms change that there's like a rise in resurgent social conservatism that's often though not always uh, faith-based. So that this increase in conservative movements, do you recognize those in your own context? And what do you think could be the cause or, you know, at, at, at the fundamentals of these shifts? And Alan referred to, um, you know, economic factors that may lead to, uh, to um, yeah, an, an increased interest in, in joining such conservative movements. But that is not the whole story, of course. So what do you see in your own context? And, um, and do you recognize this rise in anti-feminism um, that so many of us have been referring to as the backlash? And let me uh, start with you, uh, Maria. Okay. So, um, so thank you, thank you for inviting me to be part of this uh, very, very interesting session. And I, I've thoroughly enjoyed Alan's presentation, and um, um, and I'm, I'm, I look forward to sort of other speakers and and commentary on on how we go forward from here because. Um, um, and, and responding specifically to your question on resurgent social conservatism and how we see it, how I see it within our context. Um, so, I mean, I think the impulse within the paper, really, as as I understood it and I, as I read through it, is is and as as Alan just pointed out, is is a move towards a systems transformation, um, so a more radical um, change agenda and and work that moves beyond behavior and individual change programs that we've somehow sort of gotten used to. Uh, and as such, it's it's a very commendable and a much needed intervention. And I, I, I uh, you know, I welcome it very much. Um, and as someone who's been associated with gender and women's rights, as well as men and masculinities movement for some time now, I think it's, it's, it's much, much needed. 
Um, um, and I think the paper very rightly situates this debate in a reflection on political, economic, environmental, and sociocultural forces that shape gender injustice and, and injustice more generally. And so perhaps to be even more critical here, um, I, I think I would like to suggest that the need is not just to strategize and assess the opportunities and threats that these factors pose to social justice or to the work that we do, but really to understand that addressing or, or perhaps a better word is dismantling these structures of oppression um, that shift and change with time, be it authoritarian regimes, uh, militarism or security, securitized world orders or the new liberal economic order is, is really our work. So it's not just accommodation or learning to handle resistance better. When we talk about gender transformative work with men and boys on patriarchal masculinities, it is about resistance and, and challenging these very systems and not just the ways that we can address the threats that arise from these systems. So it's a subtle shift and it's very much present in the paper as well. And I just wanted to emphasize this because sometimes I fear this, uh, there's a lot of discussion on, on rising social conservatism or um, backlash and, and sometimes uh, that can sort of make us feel like in, that in this moment we face resistance, but I think it, it's it's a much, much broader uh, issue. Um, so it's not just backlash that we need to address. The, the resistance to change always exists and backlash always exists and, and power will always reconfigure itself and manifest itself through changing political and economic realities. And sometimes this is more visible and other times it's not. And I think we're going through a period where it's become much more visible. Uh, and perhaps the reason why I'm emphasizing this is because um, conservatives, uh, conservatism for us uh, um, is, is very much a very persistent and stubborn reality from, you know, for those of us from the global south. And, and so where there has been a rise in populist regimes in, global, in the global north and in the south, and in, also in the south, and in our context too, certainly it has taken on new shapes and forms. Um, it is, as I have said, a very persistent reality. And, and by this, I'm not at all suggesting that it's a cultural phenomena or to do with conservative social norms or backwardness of these areas, but very much about how norms and conservatism arise and take new directions from its encounter with, you know, social political conditions of our times. So, you know, in our context of, from colonialism <clears throat> to, to neocolonialism to um, and, and then anti-colonialist nationalist movements and how they shaped ideas of men and masculinities and women. And, and, and to bring it to, to the present day context, I mean, Pakistan itself, its role and heavy investment in religious extremism as a client state of the US uh, during the Soviet war and then repeated military coups uh, um, uh, uh, and its, its role as a frontline state in the war on terror and the resulting nexus between religious groups, military, and now political elite that take on tropes of religious signifiers to gain uh, relevance and, and to stay salient, really. So, so we've had waves of religiosity, you know, ebb and flow, and invariably these battles are fought on the bodies of women and their rights, as well as those of minorities, by very violent and often militant masculinities. Um, and at times, these influences... Um, converge with ruling regimes and can be much more toxic in, in the form of very structural constitutional legislative shifts that we, you know, years after we still struggle with. And at times they also stand apart, the, 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 the um, you know, religion versus um, political regimes. Um, so non-state non actors with their agenda will target women in the search for political significance and control. Um, and I think since this is an international audience, Malala's shooting in Pakistan was, is, is one case in point. So Pakistan's context is, is really beset with unstable democracy, with a Praetorian military, which is hypervigilant, um, and a very heavy appropriation of religion, where the status and the agency of women and, and gender in, um, justice become arenas for political point scoring and, and markers of legitimacy for both the masculine state apparatus and and the masculine and masculine non-state actors also. Um, and these authoritarian political regimes, political parties, or non-state actors will use narratives and discourses to attract supporters and advance their political agenda um, um, and, and to stay politically relevant, right? And they, the narratives can draw from anxieties against Islamophobia, uh, rejection of Western imperialism, which is a reality, then religious folklore or pseudoscience and questions of family values, etc. and some of which Alan also referred to. So certainly these kinds of analysis must inform our work um, and, and these contexts 
will, will shift from location to location. Um, and so we, to, to be able to understand why these particular discourses are relevant, not only for women and gender rights, but also find the kind of masculinities that are shaped by these religious, social, political nexuses that may emerge at various points in time that are at times local and then at times transnational also. And I think that's the challenge of, of, of staying true to these various sort of contexts. Um, and I think that is my only sort of um, question on what's missing. I think it's, of course, because this is a discussion paper which tries to look at global trends. I think those contexts of how um, these configurations happen in different ways in different locations sometimes, sometimes become less nuanced. Um, but I think it's 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 a very very important step to really sort of um, to make our work much more political than it has been in the past. So um, I, I'll pass on I think to to other speakers who may want to comment on this. Thank you, Maria. And um, I think it was a really good reminder that you're skinning um, that we we risk that we become only responsive to the backlash. And you said it's not just about handling the resistance, but it's about actually transforming or seeking to transform the systems and the structures and the institutions that are at the cause, at the underlying causes of this violence. And um, it reminds me of previous conversations we had for us to articulate what are we for? Because when you respond to backlash, you tend to be responsive and say what you're against. But how can we be part of the conversation of the systems and the structures that we want to be for, that are for the people? Um, so I thought that was a really good reminder. Thank you for that. Um, I want to move over to Mary. Do you uh, recognize perhaps some of the, um, uh, the, the context that uh, Maria has also sketched um, around the links with masculinities and violence? Um, and she mentioned the importance of contextualizing those trends as well. And we know your uh, work has done a lot. And you, you are, you have the floor and you are on mute. So I think you would have to unmute yourself. Yes, I am. Sorry. <clears throat> I missed a minute of what you were saying. So sorry to be jumping in late. Um, well, yes, I absolutely think that um, the con context is everything in, 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 in most cases. And in the case of Nicaragua, which I think um, Douglas and I will be sharing sort of different parts of the same story, uh, much of the backlash that we're experiencing that is being experienced now in Nicaragua is really has its roots in the work of the feminist movement and feminist organizing in the 90s. Um, I also wanted to say how happy I am to be here and um, how much I learned from the discussion paper. I think it was just really excellent. And um, I'm really just happy to see these thorny issues being um, addressed and, and trying, to un, un, ha, trying to unravel them in such a thoughtful way. I'm also really happy to be on this panel with Douglas and we've known each other for a long, long time. And uh, through our the work of Puntos de Encuentro and the Nicaraguan um, Network of Women Against Violence. And I see also my colleagues, um, Evelyn Flores and Ruben Reyes are here. So really happy to see you. And um, as I said, I think Douglas and I have Different different perspectives on the same issue, and I'm really looking forward to hearing um, what Douglas has to say. So I think my contribution is to set the stage a little bit about Nicaragua and what has happened um, recently, but located in the the 1990s when the feminist movement really started to address violence against women in a, in a very important way. And um, and start passing, calling for passing the first law, some of the first laws in Latin America against domestic violence. And in the early 90s, um, I was involved with the Nicaragua Network of Women Against Violence in carrying out a study on violence against women um, in the city of Leon, which we did as a way of 
providing the evidence that would prove to policymakers that it was important to pass these laws against domestic violence. And really, to the surprise of everyone, we found that over one half of women, that is 52%, had experienced physical or sexual partner violence in their lives, and over a quarter had experienced it in the last 12 months, which was much more than anybody imagined. And um, because women weren't talking about it at the time, this is a time when you know violence was really seen as a as a private issue and um, and something that just affected a few women. So this evidence was an important part of the women's movement's campaign to change the laws subsequently to um, change policies around um, uh, police. Uh, police services, creating women and children's police stations, and also the women's movement and Puntas de Encuentro had a really important role in this, um, in campaigns, not just to raise awareness, but to really challenge patriarchal norms uh, that were underpinning violence against women. And Puntos, I'm sure Douglas will talk about some very important edutainment programs that they did on for television and radio called Sesto Sentido and Contra Corriente, um, which were very influential and had a huge reader um, audience um, in Nicaragua. So we looked, we wanted to look 20 years later um, and also 20 years after Beijing, because this the first study was in 1995. We did another study in 2016 to see what had changed. And this is one of the first times that we've been able to measure in any country changes over such a long period, over 20, 20 years, and have comparable data on violence. And we found an astounding 70% drop in physical intimate partner violence compared to 20 years earlier. So this is independent of changes in education and other demographic factors. That was, I, th I think we're still sort of understanding what that means, but it was really you know, a th thrilling in the sense that it really shows that this kind of organizing can make a difference. Interestingly and disturbingly, sexual violence did not decrease during this period. Um, sexual intimate partner violence was the same over the 20 year period and possibly even, um, and, and may have been even, has even grown. So that's something that we really need to think about. So the last thing I wanna say before passing over to Douglas is um, a few of the clear messages that have come out of this. And I have now, continued to do more statistical analysis, and we also did a lot of qualitative um, data collection and trying to understand the pathways that made the difference. And one of the things that we have found is that, first of all, women's views on the acceptability of violence have changed drastically. And this is particularly um, strong among young women. So if 20 years ago, almost a third of women Thought, and usually these figures are, um, are similar to what men think. These really measure sort of social norms broadly. A third of women felt that there were reasons why a man deserved to be beaten. And now that's down to um, less than 8% totally. So that's, that's a really large change in the acceptability of violence. And we found that the changes are due to knowledge of the laws and actually, and Douglas and Evelyn and Ruben will be happy to hear this, actually women who have watched one of the TV shows, uh, either by Puntos or some of the other ones, or saw a, or were um, exposed to a message, could remember a message against violence from the women's movement, were more likely to say that violence is never justified. They were more likely to know where women can go and they were more likely to actually seek help if they were abused. So this is one of the first times that we actually have statistical data proving the impact of the of feminist organizing. And in this, I include not just the women's movement, but also all the work that Douglas and, um, and Ruben and the group of men against violence also carried out. Um, 
in terms of the key risk factors, though, for violence now, it's still, I think, important to understand that the main risk factor is not anything having to do with women. It has to do still with men's patriarchal attitudes and behaviors. And the major predictor of whether a woman will be beaten is whether she is often afraid of her husband. And the women who are most afraid of their husbands are women whose husbands drink regular, drink alcohol regularly, are very controlling of their behavior, men who fight with other men, and men who have concurrent relationships with other women. And together, this is a, a cluster of behaviors that um, that predicts women's fear and violence. So I think that these data show the importance both of working on women's empowerment, strengthening women's movements, um, women's uh, st strengthening their knowledge of their own rights, but also the real importance of working with men to reduce their patriarchal attitudes and behavior. And finally, um, linked to what Alan has said, I think it's so important that it shows that knowledge of the laws, not just it's not just social norm change, it's structural change. It's having more services. It's having laws that really shape what people think is acceptable and allowable. Um, I'm gonna stop here because this takes us to 2016. And as Douglas will tell you, in 2018, during this period, we already began to see a backlash within the government against the feminist movement and um, beginning to dismantle many of the services and protections that had come across, had happened in the last 20 years. And then in 2018, this all unraveled very quickly and it has had a huge impact on women um, and the whole population. So I want to stop now and let Douglas tell both um, his perspective on this same period, but also uh, tell what happened next. Gracias, Mary. Un gusto verte, escucharte. Y gracias, Alan, a María, todas estas perspectivas. Eh, este documento que se hizo desde Men in Gay, muy interesante, ¿no? que nos permite poder reflexionar sobre cómo se juntan todo este movimiento backlash, eh, conservador, todos los ismos juntados en contra de los derechos de las mujeres, las niñas, en, en contra del derecho de la igualdad. Y también Mary hace una, un recorrido histórico. Mary, me gusta escuchar todo ese gran recorrido que, del trabajo del movimiento de mujeres, el movimiento feminista, que ha tenido en Nicaragua, que han sido eh, las que, los únicos movimientos que han promovido la promoción de la igualdad eh, de las mujeres, de las niñas, y demandar que nosotros los hombres generemos nuestro propio proceso de reflexión. Y en esa demanda, en los 90, fue que surge el grupo de hombres contra la violencia y el trabajo con los hombres, donde, la, donde además de promover los derechos de las mujeres, también las mujeres nos dijeron, es importante que ustedes comiencen a trabajarse ustedes solos, que se organicen, que puedan promover su propio espacio y que hablen con otros hombres. Ahí fue que eh, eh, nuestro trabajo parte de esta motivación, inspiración del feminismo. Eh, como Mary lo plantea, hay un antes, hay un después, hay muchas miradas alrededor de eso, y luego a partir del 2018 con, eh, hay una crisis sociopolítica en Nicaragua que viene a, 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 desmont, a desmantelar, a cambiar todo este, avance, todo este avance en materia jurídica que se había promovido por la promoción de los derechos de las mujeres, de las niñas en Nicaragua. Es un marco jurídico eh, que generaba que muchas mujeres se sintieran más seguras y libres de violencia y que hubiese un Estado que pudiese sancionar estos hechos de violencia contra las mujeres y contra las niñas. Pero ya en 2018 hubo una crisis sociopolítica. Eh, por el mismo contexto hay una violencia estatal, una violencia patriarcal que violenta los derechos humanos de las personas, de las mujeres, de los jóvenes, de las niñas, de todas las personas que se manifiestan en contra de diversas problemáticas sociales y a partir de eso una violencia estatal militarizada a través de la policía y comienza un desmantelamiento, como dice Mary, eh, del sistema de atención, protección, eh, seguimiento a, a, a las mujeres eh, víctimas o sobrevivientes de la violencia comienzan a desaparecer 
la Comisaría de la Mujer, y la Niñez y la Adolescencia, también comienza a promoverse otro enfoque. Antes eh, hemos hablado de eh, que la violencia contra las mujeres es un problema de salud pública y en ese sentido, por el mismo contexto político, se comienza a hablar de desavenencias familiares. Nos recuerda en los 90 que se hablaban que era un problema de pareja, un problema íntimo, y no lo habláramos que es un problema de salud pública, hablar de la violencia. Entonces también hay un contexto que desde las organizaciones sociales feministas no se puede trabajar en las comunidades y se dice son desavenencias familiares. Todos estos problemas de pareja íntimo se pueden resolver con algunos pastores en la comunidad, con algún líder comunitario que los va a mandar a rezar varios padres nuestros, los va a poner a dialogar y otra vez los regresa a la casa con los perpetradores. Entonces, a partir de eso también eh, hay una eh, persecución sobre organizaciones que promueven los derechos humanos, específicamente las mujeres, y alrededor de eso eh, el cierre de algunas organizaciones que, que están eh, demandando que se garantice el marco jurídico de la ley 779, una eh, ley integral para la protección y promoción de los derechos de las mujeres, que se sancione la violencia hacia las mujeres, a los niños en todos los ámbitos. Y a partir de eso también eh, en, hay un desmalamiento total, comienzan a cerrar eh, lo que son eh, los centros de atención de las mujeres, los centros de albergue de atención a las mujeres, porque no hay condiciones, desde el mismo estado hay una persecución, deben de cerrarlo para la atención y al mismo tiempo tienen que cerrar, muchos, muchos albergues se cierran eh, para, la, para la atención, en muchas organizaciones no tienen ya la capacidad porque no tienen recursos financieros eh, y al mismo, al, al, al mismo tiempo se promueven ley que, eh, la, del delito, el ciberdelito, que sancionan que las organizaciones no pueden estar trabajando diversos temas vinculados al tema de la prevención de la violencia hacia la mujer y a las niñas, y alrededor de eso también un mayor control de dónde proviene el dinero para poder trabajar con ellos por el tema de la crisis política. Y en ese sentido, eh, como parte también de la crisis política, está conectado eh, esto que Alan plantea sobre cómo está conectada la violencia estatal, estas expresiones de violencia mil militarizadas, y comenzamos a ver eh, a un aumento de los femicidios con mayor saña, eh, hacia el cuerpo de las mujeres, más desapresiones de las mujeres, desapresiones de los niños, de las niñas, eh, con, más, con más cizaña, eh, más misoginia, con más odio hacia los cuerpos de las mujeres que aparecen disfiguradas, eh, as, asesinadas a mano de los hombres en diversos espacios y al mismo tiempo de, de, no hay un sistema, eh, tenemos impunidad, no hay un sistema que castigue, que sancione a los perpetradores de violencia hacia las mujeres y a los niños, y además de eso, eh, recientemente, el año pasado, eh, el Estado liberó a más de 8.000 presos, y dentro de estos presos habían muchos hombres asesinos que habían violado, más asesinado a las mujeres, a las hijas, habían violado a otras mujeres, y salieron libres con delitos comunes, y luego después de eso, un impacto, porque muchos de estos hombres que habían asesinado a, su, a, a, a otras mujeres o habían eh, frustrado el asesinato a las mujeres, salieron de las cárceles solamente a asesinar a las mujeres. Estos hombres que salieron libres por estos delitos comunes, muchos de, de estos hombres eh, mataron a sus exparejas, a su excónyuge. Entonces vemos también que hay una política de Estado patriarcal que no aborda de la mejor manera lo que es la prevención de la violencia hacia las mujeres, hacia los niños, hacia las niñas. Y por otro lado, esto está vinculado que desde 1993 que habíamos venido trabajando eh, en incorporar a los hombres para la prevención de la violencia hacia las mujeres y a los niños, habíamos eh, desarrollado campañas educativas eh, en programas de educación, sexto sentido, contracorriente, otras campañas con otros movimientos feministas donde los hombres nos sintiéramos parte de la prevención de la violencia hacia la mujer y a los niños, promoviendo otros imaginarios de que los hombres podemos cambiar, podemos eh, transformar nuestras relaciones de poder de otras maneras, un imaginario social de la campaña, y luego también a partir de la crisis política del 2018, vemos que eh, lo, al, en el imaginario social muchos hombres en Nicaragua creen que no hay una ley 779, que ya la ley 779 desapareció, no hay una ley que los sancione, entonces eh, hay un imaginario social, un mandato de que los hombres pueden hacer lo que quieran con las mujeres eh, en su relación de pareja y no hay nadie que los sancione. Vemos también que eh, no hay en el imaginario social, los medios de comunicación, otras formas positivas, más respetuosas de ser hombre, porque en el contexto vemos que hay una violencia total estatal de violencia hacia las mujeres, a los niños, en diversas maneras, diversas expresiones de la violencia. Y esto ha hecho que eh, se organicen diversos movimientos sociales que están interesados en promover 
eh, otras eh, formas de promover una cultura de Estado y hay movimientos sociales que se, están, que se están organizando, que promueven que hay que transformar la cultura de ser política, que desmantelemos esta cultura política patriarcal, machista, misógena, homofóbica y que hay que promover en, en, cuando se hayan nuevas elecciones en Nicaragua que, sean, que participen más mujeres, que participen diversos movimientos sociales, movimiento de diversidad sexual, movimientos campesinos mucho más amplio y que sea eh, la agenda, que se incorpore la, la agenda de los derechos de las mujeres fundamental para este proceso de cultura política. Y algo que hemos encontrado también que es estos nuevos movimientos progresistas también de cara a la crisis sociopolítica están interesados en un cambio radical de la cultura en Nicaragua. Sin embargo, eh, están en contra de esta mirada feminista, están en contra de promover una mirada feminista porque decimos que lo personal es político, cualquier cambio de cultura política que queramos hacer en el país tiene que pasar por acciones personales, desmantelar las relaciones desiguales de poder con las mujeres, con las niñas, integrar eh, el respeto por los derechos de homosexuales, veanas bisexuales, el respeto por el derecho de decir de las mujeres, pero de este movimiento progresista hay una mirada antifeminista, anti los derechos sexuales reproductivos, y vemos que por un lado eh, están en contra de otras violencias, pero el tema del feminismo, el tema del de derecho a decidir sobre los cuerpos de las mujeres y la diversidad sexual siguen siendo temas muy cruciales y que están en contra de eso y que también vemos que la crisis sociopolítica, el tema de la pandemia del COVID-19 eh, ha, ha profundizado el tema de la espiritualidad, ¿no? El tema de la religión, el de creer de un poder, eh, un poder omnipresente nos va a salvar, entonces recreernos a esta fuerza religiosa. Y por otro lado, algo interesante eh, acá es que eh, el estar en esta crisis sociopolítica, el contexto, el movimiento feminista ha dialogado con la iglesia, ha dialogado con la iglesia para promover de qué manera se pueden prevenir la violencia y promover una cultura política de, eh, de organizaciones sin embargo, y sin deponer los intereses del movimiento feminista, el derecho, el derecho a decidir, el derecho a ir libre sin violencia. Entonces, eh, es interesante cómo el movimiento feminista, el movimiento de mujeres, ha promovido un diálogo con iglesia para promover otras alianzas, eh, otras maneras de eh, la promoción de los derechos de la, ciudadana, de la ciudadanía, de promover que el Estado no siga violentando los derechos de todas las personas, sin deponer los propios intereses del movimiento feminista y del movimiento de mujeres. Porque ustedes saben que en el 2006, eh, hace años, cuando en Nicaragua se derogó el aborto terapéutico, el actual gobierno se alió con la Iglesia Católica para derogar la ley del aborto terapéutico que la teníamos hace más de 100, 150 años. Y entonces ahí vemos qué peligroso es estas alianzas ¿no? entre sectores políticos y sector político religioso que se alían para poder desmantelar eh, los marcos jurídicos y la promoción de los derechos de las mujeres. Y una de las cosas para cerrar, eh, eh, en el 2016, 17, antes de la crisis sociopolítica, en Nicaragua hicimos IMAGE, la encuesta internacional sobre estudios de masculinidades, que también en ese momento se estaba haciendo con fita en el infierno, Mary Elber, el equipo, y también encontrábamos cómo eh, en este estudio, una encuesta a mil personas en todo Managua, encontrábamos cómo en los hombres que eh, participaron en la encuesta tienen normalizada la expresión de la violencia, tienen normalizada la violencia en sus relaciones de pareja con los niños, con las niñas, y también estos hombres eh, habían sido testigos de violencia de parte de, de sus papás hacia su mamá, habían sido testigos de violencia, de la violencia hacia otras niñas, otras personas de la familia, pero estos hombres también habían sido, eh, 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 habían vivido violencia en la casa, en la niñez, violencia en la escuela, y como estos hombres también habían repetido todos estos patrones de violencia en sus relaciones de pareja. Pero también encontramos en esta encuesta de, de Images en Nicaragua y El Salvador, como también el hecho de ser hombres jóvenes, adultos, tienen las, nirma, las mismas normas sociales tradicionales de ser hombre. Entonces ahí pensamos, le da mayor apertura, pero ahí encontramos que muchos de ellos tienen, eh, conciben estas normas sociales tradicionales de ser hombre igual. Pero por otro lado, en el tema de paternidades, encontramos que muchos más hombres jóvenes están mucho más abiertos al cambio de poder participar en la crianza, el cuidado de los niños y de las niñas como otra manera de poder alejarse eh, del trabajo. Pero también esto, esto, como dice Mary, ha estado influenciado porque en caso de Nicaragua hemos venido trabajando de hace más de 25, 30 años con estos procesos de campaña educativa, de programas dirigidos a los hombres, pero vemos que en los últimos años 
eh, hay muy poco activismo, muy poco eh, campañas educativas, sociales en, la, en los medios de televisión o también los grupos que estamos trabajando con las masculinidades no estamos desarrollando acciones vinculadas a esto porque sabemos que es un gran riesgo. Y es importante reconocer, para cerrar con esto, es que las únicas que siguen eh, demandando eh, con todos los riesgos que esto amerita, el derecho a vivir libre de violencia, de man, a demandar la restitución de los derechos, son las mujeres las que siguen yendo a las calles, las que siguen eh, eh, demandando al Estado, al gobierno, esta restitución de derechos, y son a ellas las que están recibiendo eh, toda la persecución y todo el riesgo de la vida de lo que está pasando con la crisis sociopolítica en Nicaragua. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Douglas and, and Mary as well. I think, Mary, what you were sketching has really helped us see that Um, with a, an organized feminist movement, that change is possible and that a reduction in, in violence was really possible because of that organizing. Um, and also the importance of uh, gathering data and statistics to actually show these shifts. Um, we know that that is an ongoing call from feminist movement. We need those data. And there was a lot of discussion in the chat that this data needs to be shared with politicians. It needs to be acknowledged. And so your work, I think, is really key there. Um, at the same time, what Douglas was sketching around the current context where conservatism, um, the, that kind of marriage between the state and, and the church uh, joining hands um, to maintain and hold on to power and increase their power um, is something that has not been addressed and is actually a big become much stronger over recent years. And so I think it's a case in point that that kind of deeper structural transformation and systems transformation is, is not where Nicaragua is yet. And, and I think far from it. And it's a case in point of that rise in, um, in backlash in conservatism um, and the links actually the, the state using patriarchal violence um, as a way uh, almost to uh, to recruit people for their cause and fighting um, the, the conflict over women's body by uh, increasing restrictions and mobilizing people actually to support those restrictions on, on women's and women, women's autonomy. Um, there was a comment in the chat that I want to highlight because um, it resonated with multiple people. Um, and it's also around the understanding and collecting data of what's actually happening. And Ross Funk said, uh, as we reflect on considering ways to double down on our efforts to impact on structural and systemic change to advance gender justice, I'm curious as to what indicators we might identify that suggest changes in these structures and systems, right? So our focus has been quite on individual kind of behavior change and do individuals experience more or less violence, but what about the violence conducted actually through these systems and structures. How do we measure them? How do we understand them? Um, changes in law have been mentioned and clearly this is one indicator, but there are also significant limits to change that laws can make. Um, and even the state actually using uh, power uh, over. Uh, so it's definitely the state is not always a trustworthy partner here. Um, there seems to be value in clearly articulating and defining some of these indicators of structural and systemic change. And he ends with, and I, I'll join him there, my apologies if we have it already and I'm just not aware of it. So it would be wonderful if those of you who do know of, of such kind of indicators and ways of measuring and breaking down it would be wonderful to hear in the chat or from our speakers. Um, I also want to move us into more kind of practical conversation. Now we've heard, you know, different kind of contexts, how they've changed over time. And um, we'll get to the, the work with faith-based institutions that I think really came very prominently into what was shared so far. But before we do that, just a broader question to Mary, Maria, Douglas. Um, what do you think are the key issues and, and actions that Men Engage Alliance members and those working on, on engaging men and transforming masculinity should actually take now in order to respond to these challenges that have been sketched? And one thing I would like to highlight here is what's also sketched in the paper of this rise in men's rights groups or men's rights movements or men that are anti-feminist and that join 
what seems to be quite an organized um, yeah, group of, of, of uh, those articulating feminist backlash. And they are really uh, led by, by certain men and they have appealed to certain men. So do you recognize those kind of men's groups uh, in your men's rights groups, in your own context? What are maybe some of the pros and cons for men engaged to be working with them or engaging with them or should we at all? And yeah, how can we handle that kind of anti-feminist backlash that is really led by men? Um, quite a bit, I would love to see who, who would like to respond first. I can say something about the um, indicators, if that makes sense. Yes. And I'll, ma I'll make it quick. Um, but several people mentioned, you know, the Davos index and, um, you know, different um, gender empowerment index. And um, a lot of these have real weaknesses. And the Davos index is really, um, it's evident in the fact that Nicaragua has, for the last few years, come out among the five or six most gender equitable countries in the world, um, which is actually a really unfortunate message at this time. Um, and I would offer as, um, as an alternative, the Women, Peace and Security Index that has come out of Georgetown University. And I, I think it's a really interesting one. And Jenny Klugman who developed it has talked about it um, a lot. And it has three elements to it, <laughs> just as I, I downloaded it and then lost it. Um, they are inclusion, justice and security are the three elements. So the laws, it's not just the laws, but are the laws being implemented? Do women have, have access to justice? Um, the other ones around inclusion and security include um, women's freedom from violence and domestic violence. And just to show the difference there, Nicaragua comes out somewhere like number 50 on over 100 countries on this index. So it, it matters a lot what we're measuring. And if we don't include women's sexual and reproductive rights and, um, and violence, we end up having something very skewed that is either laws or women's participation in parliament, for example, um, and quotas, which you, know, you can have, Nicaragua has a, a high quota of women in power and government, and that has not translated into um, power for women on the ground. Okay, um, can I can I go next? Please. Yes. So uh, I think um, so. Your question is broader and it's more about action. Um, but I think just to, uh, I feel like what we also need to do, and which is also action in some ways, is really to have a, a a more informed and a more detailed discussion amongst ourselves in various groups and settings, depending upon where we are placed, but is, is a discussion on this anti-feminist backlash and trying to analyze against the context and the players within that. Um, so these can be, again, local, regional, or transnational. And of course, they're connected to and build upon each other and then also stand separate um, and make their own very lethal and very unique configurations that we then struggle with within local spaces. So I think it's important to see backlash as not just by aggrieved parties or those who see their own power diminishing or threatened, but also backlash also involves uh, relatively powerless groups that um, um, you know feel disenfranchised within because of other other, other social and political conditions. Uh, it really gathers strength from these crises, you know, such as the neoliberal economic social policies and this idea of, this, I think Alan spoke about earlier, this disappearing state uh, or the very militarized and securitized world order that we live in that makes it very easy for rights and authoritarian rights based, you know, rights groups or um, authoritarian or non-democratic movements or religious fundamentalisms to really peddle their agenda and create very polarized forms of debates and uh, effectively appeal to these men for support, right? Uh, which really feed off this anxiety about perceived loss of power. So I think as we move forward, I think that needs to be acknowledged. And, and, and perhaps that is why the, 
what we are peddling, so to speak, is not as attractive, right? Because it doesn't speak to their social and economic political realities. It's very much about gender. It's very much about home. It's about power sharing, but it doesn't really link to the kind of social realities that the, the men that we want to talk to live in, perhaps. So, um, so I, I think if we recognize that it's not just misogyny that drives this backlash, right? I'm not suggesting that it's not misogyny, but it's not just misogyny. Uh, perhaps it's also um, the, the use of this kind of discourse to stay politically relevant. It's a very political, a very strategic use of this discourse that we some, somehow tend to not be able to um, frame it simply as misogyny. So I, I think that's an important distinction that I just want to highlight. And, and as we go forward, I think that the, the, the need to engage is not just with um, men's group, but also there are women within this backlash, um, um, you know, this anti-feminist backlash. And, and that's been a point of, uh, you know, debate and, and, and tension within our own feminist movement in Pakistan in terms of, because the backlash also uh, to our work comes from pietist uh, women's groups. Uh, which are organized and very much mobilized and they align themselves with religious political parties that see the feminist movement or the women's rights movement or gender justice as anti-family um, aligned with the West and very much feeding off Islamophobia. So those, those are the kinds of tensions that you know you have in local spaces when you align with these broader agendas, you're accused of them being Islamophobic, whereas you also stand up very much, very clearly uh, against Islamophobia and against Western imperialism. Um, so, so it's sort of th those tensions need to be, I think, um, unpacked um, um, as we think about how we go forward with this discussion of handling backlash. Thank you, Maria. Douglas? Sí. Eh, yo también concuerdo que eh, con Mary creo que es importante tener cuidado con los indicadores sobre los cuales eh, hacemos análisis, ¿no? Porque también lo que ha pasado con este ranking de estar en Nicaragua en el quinto puesto global de equidad, esto viene a despolitizar todos los procesos que ha hecho el movimiento feminista en Nicaragua y no solo eso, sino eh, los informes que eh, tienen las evidencias y cómo se violentan los derechos de las mujeres en Nicaragua, el tema de las inseguridades, el tema de los femicidios, el tem otros temas del acceso a la justicia, el acceso a la libertad, el, el acceso a organizarse. Entonces vemos también cómo todos estos indicadores siempre captan algunos elementos de, de la participación igualitaria, de cuotas, pero creo que es importante tener, ir más allá de, otra, de otros indicadores que puedan recoger de una mejor manera la realidad que tienen los países eh, vinculados a, esta, a, a estos indicadores. A mí me gusta mucho esta propuesta de estos indicadores de inclusión, justicia y seguridad, que me parece que eh, nos ayudaría a poder eh, hacer un análisis, poder hacer una visibilización de todos los hechos de lo que pasa en el caso de Nicaragua. Entonces me parece muy interesante poder replantearnos otras categorías para poder entender los contextos y a partir de eso poder eh, promover diversas iniciativas o, o, o demandar al, al ciertas eh, acciones del Estado de Nicaragua o también de las instituciones internacionales sobre derechos humanos. Eh, una de las cosas que, te, que con esto de, del antifeminismo, eh, yo creo que es importante eh, que podamos usar eh, un, un lenguaje coloquial con los grupos a los cuales está, estamos trabajando, ¿no? Porque muchas veces en el trabajo que hacemos desde nuestro activismo utilizamos un lenguaje de, ONG, de la ONG, un lenguaje muy técnico y entonces mucha gente repite soy antifeminista, soy antifeminista, pero, pero también encontramos que en la práctica promueven relaciones de respeto, de igualdad hacia otras personas. Entonces es importante cómo, cómo poder poner en agenda pública eh, acciones que nos ayuden a poder transformar estas normas tradicionales de ser hombre, de ser mujeres, que nos permitan eh, dialogar, acercarnos a grupos que no están tan cercanos a lo que hacemos en el trabajo por la igualdad, trabajar con el sector rural, el sector campesino, eh, trabajar con otros movimientos que trabajan otra, otra vivencia de la espiritualidad, otra vivencia de las religiones, que tienen apertura a poder trabajar sobre eh, otras maneras de, de las relaciones entre los hombres y las mujeres, en el caso de Nicaragua, hasta el 2005 nunca habíamos tenido un grupo antifeminista, un grupo público. Fue hasta cuando se promovió la ley 779 en Nicaragua, una ley integral que protege a las mujeres. Un grupo de abogados se presentaron a la Corte de Justicia en Nicaragua eh, y su gran líder era un boxeador 
acusado de violación mayorga, eh, hombres a favor de la igualdad y lo que estaban promoviendo era algo en contra de esta ley integral que protege a las mujeres. Entonces vemos también que hay hechos eh, mediáticos que hacen que ciertos temas o ciertos grupos salgan a respaldar eh, diversos argumentos o, o diversas posiciones eh, por una persona, por, por un hecho. Entonces creo que desde, desde Menengue de, deberíamos de eh, buscar otras alternativas, de entender las realidades, entender los diálogos que no solamente pasan por la homofobia, por la misoginia, sino que también pasan por otros factores de exclusión, de vulnerabilidad, de la pobreza, los contextos de migración, que nos ayudan a entender eh, de una mejor manera todas estas realidades para poder promover los diálogos, la solidaridad. Y es importante eh, que dentro de nuestras propias redes nacionales de masculinidades eh, hagamos un proceso para ver qué tanto están apropiados de este enfoque feminista, ¿no? Ellos están eh, a favor de la igualdad, a favor de promover mayor integración de los hombres, pero siempre tienen muchas dudas alrededor de cuando desde Men Gay públicamente decimos somos feministas, esto es lo que estamos haciendo, no todos estamos tan apropiados de lo que implica promover este enfoque en nuestro trabajo, en nuestra vida cotidiana. Entonces es importante eh, desde Men Gay regresar a las bases, a, la, a los países, a las regiones, para poder hablar cómo estamos promoviendo los enfoques en nuestros trabajos. Y la otra cosa también que yo he planteado es que es importante promover el diálogo con el movimiento feminista, con los movimientos de mujeres, con los movimientos feministas, con otro grupo eh, de, de la disidencia sexual, para poder aprender, para poder escucharnos, para poder promover alianzas. No podemos andar juntos en todos los temas, porque no tenemos tiempo ni nos interesa. Entonces, identificar algunos puntos de acción en los cuales podemos trabajar, podemos hacer elementos y luego creo que en ese sentido, desde Menengue Global, poder hacer incidencia a Boca, sí, a, a, a nivel regional, Centro de Derecho Humano, a nivel nacional, a nivel regional, que nos ayude a poner en la agenda pública nacional e interna, internacional la violación de los derechos de las mujeres, de las niños, de los niños, eh, de la comunidad, el efecto que hay, a, a, a toda esa perspectiva. Y, eh, y seguir trabajando algo que hemos venido haciendo, ¿no? ¿Qué implica trabajar con los hombres? Voy a cerrar con esto porque también he visto que en caso de Centroamérica y Latinoamérica están los hombres de la fraternidad, ¿no? Están trabajando un grupo religioso que promueve que los hombres no sean alcohólicos, no dejen, eh, la, que dejen la violencia, pero siguen promoviendo este sistema patriarcal desigual, no derechos sexuales, no derechos reproductivos. Entonces es importante desde Menengue decir cuál es el enfoque del trabajo con los hombres y de las masculinidades que estamos promoviendo desde Menengue nacional, regional y global, que nos permita eh, compartir los principios públicos y también que nos permita monitorear desde nuestro código de ética y conducta, eh, estos procesos de diálogo político y sociales que se están promoviendo eh, a nivel global. Thank you, everyone. Um, I think for me, one key takeaway is that how, how do we appeal um, to uh, those who tend to be on the fence or Um, who find interest in the in the men's rights groups, and as several of you said, the language that we use, Douglas framed it as it can be quite kind of NGO. Uh, Maria, you also said we don't speak to economic or social realities. We tend to talk about gender equality, and those things are not appealing to everybody. And it's a very challenging line to walk, I think, because I think while we want to play a role in preventing um, that. Uh, men uh, join um, join anti-feminist movements. At the same time, we want to be able to keep on using the political language that um, that we uh, we hear and we support from the feminist movements. And uh, so, how do we not uh, throw that away um, and still find ways to um, yeah to better articulate and broaden our agenda? Um, and I think what several of you also said is the importance of contextualizing. So we can have, it's important to have global conversations, to have cross-national conversations, but the manifestations of this kind of conservatism um, is uh, happening in different ways, in different contexts. And so it's important um, that we do not articulate in one size fits all, 
uh, but we articulate that locally. I see Mary, you want to respond. That's great. I want to invite Alan in also, because uh, this will be our last kind of round and we only have a couple of minutes left before we um, we have to end the conversation. Um, so I just want to give you all the floor for just a couple more minutes, kind of a final really key uh, giveaway um, for the Men Engage Alliance membership for us collectively uh, as a movement. One of the things that the paper says is, and Gabrielle Hussein's quote was key here, we have to do more. <laughs> um, so what would that look like? I uh, would love to hear from you for a final round before we close it off. And Mary, you raise your hand, so please go ahead. Um, so I, that's a really important question. And I think there's this, I'm a little bit torn between, you know, how do we address the backlash and how do we appeal and, you know, get engaged in broader political movements? And I have a, a little bit of a feeling that it can be a distraction focusing too much on the backlash, which tends to be often sort of a, a fringe group. They don't necessarily represent sort of broad, um, broad, you know, views. <laughs> and so my, one thing that I am thinking of is the importance of engaging in broader political processes. And, you know, as Alan said so well, it's um, when he talked about the limitations of social norms work that focuses on the individual. And really this work on masculinity is profoundly political. Um, I think in Nicaragua, what's interesting and a little bit unusual is that the work on of men against violence, in my view, correct me if you think I'm wrong, Douglas, came out of a feminist movement. It started really early. It didn't happen because it, it didn't come out of HIV work or other kind of sort of development work. It came out of, um, out of feminist, organ feminist men and women organizing and therefore has always been very political, I think. Um, where I think it's really important right now, when we look, for example, at the backlash, the backlash in Nicaragua is happening through political parties. And, um, you know, the, the women's movement to a large degree came out of rejection of the Sandinista party and their lack of um, attention to women's rights. And now the young students, feminists, who are part of the resistance to the Ortega government are also being asked to choose between feminism and their political spaces. And a really quick example is this young, wonderful leader, Amaya Copens, who was jailed by the Ortega regime for over a year. She was given an award um, by the US government as a woman of courage. And when she came wearing her purple bandana with a women's rights symbol, she was just savaged in, uh, publicly by people from the resistance movement itself because you know she's a feminist, she's pro-abortion. You know, and, and I'm really inspired by these young feminists who are insisting that they don't have to choose. And I feel like men engage and male allies um, a really important space is to be creating space, holding space for these young women feminists within the resistance movement, um, rather than sort of, you know, specifically working on, you know, a sort of more general uh, backlash of men. That, that's a thought, but I'm, you know, really want to hear what Douglas thinks of this. Douglas, if you would like to respond, you're very welcome to. Sí, eh, a mí me hace pensar lo que dices tú, Mary. Yo soy de la idea también de lo que tú promueves, ¿no? De que tenemos que transformar una cultura política que integre la mirada y los derechos de las mujeres, donde son las mujeres que están promoviendo sus propios derechos, sus propios liderazgos, que integre otras miradas, porque hay una resistencia a esta cultura eh, tradicional partidaria política y a mí una de las cosas que a veces me hace me molesta el ruido es por ejemplo decimos la derecha tenemos que revisar la derecha la izquierda el centro tenemos que revisar eh, las formas de expresión políticas patriarcales sean de izquierda o sean de derecha porque también hemos visto que en contexto donde la izquierda está gobernando los países en América Latina el Caribe en el mundo 
¿Qué tan distinto es de otras maneras de hacer? Entonces es importante cuestionar estos sistemas políticos, estas culturas de hacer política que violentan los derechos de las mujeres, que, que, la, que participen, que sancionan, que las cuestionen, y, o que muestran ideas progresistas, que en el fondo eh, hay muchas dudas alrededor de eso. Entonces creo que sí es importante... Eh, poder promover otras formas de, de, la, de hacer cultura política, de hacer otro trabajo y también que los hombres que estamos promoviendo una cultura diferente podamos transformar esta cultura política machista, patriarcal, mucho más eh, participativa de lo personal, político, integradora, que respete y que aprendamos del movimiento de mujeres que la escuchemos eh, de cara a, a establecer una alianza en particular. Y en ese sentido, eh, en el caso de Nicaragua, eh, las mujeres eh, eh, so, están, bien or están organizadas demandando que se transforme esta cultura machista patriarcal que se integre en una mirada. No puede haber una cultura política nueva en Nicaragua sin la participación de las mujeres eh, en ese sentido. Amaya Copen y, y hay otras mujeres jóvenes también eh, como ellas que están interpelando a estos hombres, a estas mujeres eh, progresistas de integrar estos temas tan importantes como el aborto, el tema del derecho sexual, el derecho reproductivo, la participación. Y es también, también es importante, creo, en, en Main and Gate, integrar una mirada intergeneracional, mucho más hombres y mujeres jóvenes dialogando sobre estos procesos eh, de las realidades en los países que tenemos. Thank you. Thank you, Douglas. Gracias. And Maria, over to you for your last thoughts for today. Yeah, I, I think this, uh, I think what Mary referred to this, uh, and I think Alan started this uh, idea that, you know, discussed this idea of moving from a social norms theory approach to, to a more social movement theory approach. And I think specifically, I think for me that what that translates into is, is, Um, reducing this preoccupation or reliance on measurement of social change. Um, I think sometimes that sort of um, sets, up, sets us up uh, for depoliticization of our work because this work is very nuanced um, and this work is often not captured qualitatively or captured by large data. So, you know, how do we maintain that balance as we go forward? Because for this work to be really political, uh, It, it, you know, we, we need to sort of um, allow ourselves the, the, the space to be, in, you know, in a, in a, um, to, to not be able to capture change at times uh, and, and, and to recognize that that's what, you know, sometimes social change means. Um, so maybe I'm not phrasing it correctly, but I just think that uh, the way forward needs to be much more political and, and, and one way of being, and there are other ways as well. And I, I, there's not enough time to go into, but for me, a very sort of um, important way is, is to step away to some extent from this immediate need for, to capture social change. Uh, I think it's it's shifting, it's changing, uh, it's 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 so complicated, um, you know, as Alan's paper does point out. So, um, can we really do justice to that? And and when we push ourselves into those frames, what do we actually lose? So I think that's important. For me. Thank you, Maria. Alan, any final thoughts or maybe questions going forward from you? Um, yeah, well, lots of thoughts. We haven't got time to get into it. Thank you very much to um, Douglas, Mary and Maria. Fantastic comments and discussion. Um, I mean, I agree with a lot of what's been said. I mean, that last point, I very much agree with that kind of um, the, the danger of projectization, which, you know, we're all subject to. But um You know, we can't do what we're, trying, we're talking about wanting to do if we maintain that kind of project-oriented kind of framework. And I, and I really take Maria's point about, um, you know, a more complicated view of misogyny and the exploitation of misogyny and narratives around masculinity to serve particular kind of elite projects. So, I mean, I think something to think about for us is kind of to what extent are, are we involved in an anti-elite politics? Because I think there, is, there are ways in which the kind of masculinities discourse has, you know, in some ways been complicit with an elite politics, right? It, the ways in which things get framed or decontextualized as kind of norms of masculinity as kind of a culturalist explanation of a range of phenomena is in effect serving an elite politics, right? Um, so how do we challenge that? So we very clearly need a, 
an intersectional, you know, forgive the jargon, but a, you know, a complex view of the way in which patriarchal masculinities are bound up with racialization, um, you know, class exploitation. So, you know, to some extent, I think, and I've written about this elsewhere, that even the category of men and boys is a bit of a problem if we don't always disaggregate it. You know, um, it sets up a kind of homogenous notion that there's this kind of blob of men and boys who we need to work with. And, you know, depending on who they are and where they're positioned, we need to have different conversations with them and different kinds of work to do with them. And I think some of the, you know, there is a kind of direct work, like how do we get better at simply talking to men and boys, particularly if we want to kind of enlist them over our side versus the men's rights side. Um, But then I think there are things about kind of narrative frames, about the family, about the nation, about justice, you know, which the, you know, the right, for want of a better formulation, uh, appropriates, right? Um, And uses masculinities in the service of its narratives around family, nation and justice. Um, and, you know, people care about those things, right? So uh, we, we need to be in that kind of narrative struggle about resisting heteronormative framings of the family and ethno-nationalist framings of the nation and notions of justice which maintain state violence, et cetera, et cetera, right? So to, to me, that's something about how do we get better at, you know, communications, shaping public, discourse and narratives, use of the media, you know, practically those are the kinds of strategies and skills that I think, you know, we need to pay more attention to cultivating, you know, and learning from others about how they do that. But thanks again. This is a great conversation. Obviously, the start of, you know, or a stimulus to much further conversation as well. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. And that last point around communication and articulation, the discourse development is an important area for our new Men Engaged strategic plan, actually. Uh, And also key takeaway, contextualization. Like this cannot be just framed. We can learn from each other, but we need to really look at what the local realities and contexts are. Also for what Alan was saying, men and boys is as if it's one kind of category that you know I, there's this saying that in many contexts if i'm from the netherlands i have more in common with a man from the netherlands than i have with a woman from x other place in the world and i think there's something around that contextualization and our local realities which is where we live at the end of the day where our families are where our dear ones are that we shouldn't forget and with through men engage alliance being an alliance we have the opportunity to work with our membership on the ground and to connect people to learn from each other um, so I really want to thank Douglas, uh, Maria, Mary for being with the conversation today. Uh, Alan, uh, thanks to you again as well. I also want to thank Urbinia. Unfortunately, she was not able to be here because of the internet connection, but she was involved in the preparations and we hope to hear from her at another moment. And thank you all again. Thanks everybody for joining. Thanks for the lively comments in the chat. And thanks to our speakers most of all for, for being here.